panel is more of a triptych. Um, what we're going to have is um, a short presentation by Michelle, and then we can move about 15 minutes, then but open discussion with that for 10 minutes. Then Matias <laughs> the same thing. Then Martin's going to say whatever he's going to say, and we're have more or less open discussion on it. So, Michelle, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to thank uh, for this uh, invitation and to this uh, exciting conference and the uh, occasion of the welcoming of the power and studies. It's a great pleasure uh, to, be, to be here. Actually, I'm going to make a very small point. I'm going to talk about uh, Van Frassen's loss of reality reflection. Uh, who uh, uh, Van Frassen, as you know, in his book uh, Scientific uh, Representation, Paradoxes uh, Perspective, um, addresses a very uh, fundamental and basic issue of epistemology, but which has, I think, an important bearing on philosophy of science issues uh, as well. So, let me remind you briefly uh, how Vass uh, phrases uh, his uh, uh, loss of reality objection. So, quote, how an abstract entity, such as a mathematical structure, can represent something that is not abstract, something in nature. So an abstract entity is a model. It is a structure, a set of elements organized by some relations. So the matching correspondence is between data models and theoretical models. Hence, as he says, the theory does not confront the observable phenomena, but only certain representations of them, that is, data models representations of phenomena. So, the empirical adequacy of a theory is not adequacy to the phenomena, and this is the objection, but to the phenomena as described, as described or represented by us. Okay, now the question is, what reasons do we have to believe that my, you know, according to Bass, we have to speak First person, huh? why am I doing representing you know, first person activity? What reason do I have to believe that my representing artifact, the scientific theory, correctly hits on something real? Phenomena, at least. And so the loss of reality objection again is how can an abstract mathematical structure represent a concrete real phenomenon? I think this for example. And so are we, are we imprisoned in our representations? And it is an idealistic way of setting the problems. Okay, we have our models and our representations, the representational artifacts on the one hand, and then we have reality, phenomenal reality. What's the connection between them? Right? And so that's the, that's the problem. So, before we tackle the problem in Van Frassen's way, we have to remind uh, that uh, Van Frassen introduces a novel distinction in his book between appearances, which are representing structures, and phenomena, which are, according to him, represented. So phenomena will be observable entities, objects, events, processes. Thus, observable phenomenon is redundant in his terminology. So appearances will be the contents of observation or measurement outcomes. So appearances are structures or models, such as data models. They are constructed by a user, by me, uh, who adopts a certain point of view, a key to perspective, on a phenomenon. So this is the broad view that Van Frassen advocates. And I am introducing here a new item, which is a phenomenal structure. So you have the real phenomena, things that we can observe directly. And then we have data models, and then we have 
technical problem, which has also theoretical substructures, and then the theory in which the theoretical substructures are embedded. Now, the phenomenal structure, I think it's an important step because before we construct the table model, and let's take the example of the tabletop, which is an example which you can find in his book, then you decide, or I decide, I decide to pay attention to, say, the length of this tabletop, and then I construct a phenomenal structure. That is the perceived length, that is, these are the elements <coughs> of the phenomenal or perceptual structure, and there are, there are relations between them. Like these two sides are smaller than these, two other, than these two other sides. So we have a phenomenal structure. So the issue is, well, does this phenomenal structure represent real phenomena? I mean, does it correspond to real phenomena? And that's the problem of the loss of reality at the very basic level. Now, contrary to that, I use representation in a technical and mathematical sense. Representation, in my terminology, always involves some homomorphism, and thus we can only represent structures. So represent, representation is a relationship between structures. But in, again, a structure is a set of elements organized by some relations. So, strictly speaking, we never represent phenomena, but only their appearances. Okay? Granted, my use of the word representation does not conform to ordinary usage. But this is no quibble with words. It is crucial to distinguish a relation between structures, which is captured by the precise mathematical relation of homomorphism, and, on the other hand, the relation between structures, models, and phenomena, which is not captured by homomorphism. Thus, phenomena are not structures, are not structures. Yet, some of our representations do convey some information on phenomena. How can this happen? Here, the truth of judgments is at issue. So I claim that the informative content of our representations rests on true judgments, predicative judgments, assertions. It is true, for example, that this table that has four sides. Okay? Something like that. So, first, we must identify the perception, an entity as a gas and not a liquid, and we rely on the truth of observational judgments such as this is a gas. Then we can make judgments such as this state of the gas is hotter than this other state of the gas. All right? So in this room, we have gas, air, and uh, we can feel that uh, the air in this room is cooler at this moment than the air outside. So, the truth of those judgments is ascertained on the basis of direct observation. So, predicative judgments on this, of this kind do not trade on representation. When I attribute a property, which is denoted by a predicate term, to a thing, I do not represent the thing as possessing a property. So, a predicative as a set, assertive judgment does not state a representative relationship between a property on the one hand and a thing on the other hand, and much less a relation between an image in my mind and a thing. And I'm just in agree with that. There's no predicative judgment, there is no representation. So, in a predicative judgment, there is no chasm or ditch between a representing an artifact and a phenomenon, because simply there is no representation at all. So the representational procedure starts from these judgments, focuses on some selected abstracted properties, such as being hot, and relations between them, in order to construct a phenomenal structure, which is an appearance. Then we can construct a data model, we can measure temperatures of a gas, right, or pressure, volume, and so forth. 
and then we construct data models which are appearances. So the representative procedure takes its flag with the construction of homomorphic structures, data models, surface models which are smoothed out, data models, empirical substructures, embedding, etc. But this way of proceeding digs out the ditch between the phenomenon, which is not abstract, okay, and our representations of it. And this, of course, uh, makes possible, this way of proceeding, which is typical of science, makes possible uh, philosophical positions such as idealism, constructivism, and, uh, uh, and so on. So, we have the, what I call the idealistic predicament. Do we lose reality in this process? Do we have our representation? Are we in the prison of our representation? So Plato's cover with our representation. What's the connection? of our representations with reality out there. Okay. My first solution or dissolution, as he say, or the dissolution of the problem is, is typical of empiricists. He resorts to pragmatics and he says, for us, for me, the claim A, the theory is adequate to the phenomenon. And the claim B, the theory is adequate to the phenomenon as represented, that is, as represented by me, they are the same. They don't mean the same, but they cannot be uh, asserted uh, or denied separately. If I assert A, I have to assert B. And if I assert B, if I deny B, I have to deny A. So, for us, or for me, if a theory saves the appearances, okay, it also saves the phenomena. So, doubting the adequacy of the theory, according to Van Frassen, would involve placing ourselves in a godlike point of view, or a view from nowhere, a move which is blocked by the ines inescapable index indexicality of our representing thing. Hmm. <coughs> so that A and B are the same is a pragmatic tautology, and this removes the basis for the loss of reality objection. Contrast. And to deny this would make us fall prey to most paradox. I believe it is so, B, but it isn't not A. Okay. I agree that both A and B can only be uh, asserted, asserted, organized together and not separately. But I deny that a theory or a model represents phenomena. Whereas, Bass made that, well, he insists, you know, my models do represent phenomena. Even though models are abstract and phenomena are concrete. So, Bass discusses the relationship between theory and phenomena, but the crucial problem arises at the level of the relationship between the phenomenon and the phenomenal structure. So at the very basic level. To repeat, phenomena, unlike appearances, are not systems or structures. As Bass stresses, the phenomena can be measured and observed in different ways. There are various perspectives on the same phenomenon. You can select various aspects, color, size, in these uh, obvious uh, remarks. So, appearances are various perspectives. So, appearances are structures. There are perspectives, different perspectives, ways of looking at that I can have um, of the same real phenomenon. Thus, according to Bass, there is no unique inner structure inside the phenomenon waiting to be represented by us. So nature has no joints carved in it. I agree with that. I mean, there is no unique way of representing. Uh, uh, there is no unique way of constructing representations from phenomena. So broad views, holistic views, like a mechanistic, phys phys physicalist dream of a single real world is just a dream. Nevertheless, I think it is true that phenomenal things 
do have properties, but relations among them. And these are expressed in true judgments, which attribute these properties and relations, and which allow us to construct our informative representations. So, models can only represent structures. They do convey information about real phenomena, only to the extent that they are betrayed, they rely or they rest on two judgments, predicative judgments, that attribute some properties to things. Conclusion. So what is represented is what we decide to abstract from the phenomenal tar target, not the target itself. In fact, in a strict sense, phenomena are not represented by our models. The target of the reference of a representation, the real phenomenon, is not what is represented. And we lose touch with reality only if we remain imprisoned in the world of our, of our representations and homomorphic possible relationships uh, between, between uh, those. So close contact with reality is achieved in direct observation of acquaintance and expressed in two judgments, such as this is a gas which is hotter, as such as such temperature, and so on and so forth. And the usefulness and informativeness of our scientific representation is then based on observational judgments that are true, I believe, in a correspondence sense. So two judgments are more fundamental than representations, and to know is not to represent. To know is to be able, to know is to have two judgments, and our representations are parasitic on those two judgments. And Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. in this framework of thinking that, that theories are supposed to enable us to, are supposed to correspond in some way to a bunch of phenomena in the way, in, in the way that the logical consequences is supposed to. Whereas the, the, the very idea of producing a phenomenon from theory is really quite an imaginative stretch. It's very difficult to deduce. You mean deducing? I mean, to, to deduce that any particular phenomenon would be observed by any particular person. Um, what, what we typically, if you take a, a case that Van Praten talks about, like the relationship between a structure like special relativity and our experience, he thinks, well, special relativity is like this, we have this sort of practical point of view expressed by Einstein, and then you have this godlike view expressed by uh, by Minkowski, and he thinks that there's some kind of strange relationship between those two, and the, the Minkowski view is something completely different from the theory of special relativity, and that, that it's a somehow, it's, it's a purely mathematical model. Whereas the Einstein view, it doesn't appeal to phenomena in, in Van Prassen's sense, or to representations in Van Prassen's sense. And I'm not sure if it, if it appeals to observational judgments in your sense, so that's why I'm asking this question. What it appeals to is the ordinary conceptual scheme of spatial measurement and spatial observation, which is a very elementary aspect of our experience, which in a sense, in, in one sense is a conceptual representation, and in another sense it already has a kind of primitive mathematical representation to it because it, it is, after all, a set of judgments and possible judgments about where things are in space and how yes, but then, common sense. But then uh, it, it, to, to be able to decide whether special relativity is empirically adequate, you have to construct data models or appearances, huh? which are obtained by means of uh, 
measurements by means of, for example, measuring rods, blocks, things like that. And so what you do is you decide to, at the very beginning, to uh, abstract some abst aspects of phenomena which are spatial. And then you say that, well, there are some things in space-time that have some specific properties. Otherwise, and if those judgments about the belonging of those properties by those objects are wrong, then all your representation of the procedure just rests in thin air. But so in, 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 in the, you know, the relationship between Minkowski space-time and, uh, and Einstein's theory special, these are relationships between mathematical structures. If you want to hit on phenomena, then you have to rely on assertions or assertive judgments, assert propositions and that say that there are objects such as uh, 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 tables, chairs, and uh, light rays, and things like that, you know, which uh, have uh, some special properties. It can be measured in a certain way by means of rigid rods and, and clocks. Otherwise, otherwise you you only have models and structures, and then you can ask, uh, well, what's the connection between those models and uh, and reality? That's the problem. I think in science, huh? In, in science, that is the the, the 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 origin of modern science, as you know, is uh, is uh, it can be traced back to Descartes, you know, and those people, which. Uh, who know, who claim that knowing is represented. We have mathematical representations, okay? And those mathematical represent representations, well, do correspond to some external things according to some criteria. There's another, there's another so, so the, 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 the I think this is another one that's going to have to be okay. continued over a dream because we're, 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 we're running out of time. Okay, All these to those who, what's that? <laughs> I don't think I, I don't think I drink that. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, this, this so, so I want to quickly uh, convince those of you who have, haven't been convinced, in maybe you have heard versions of this already, um, that there's a place for causal reasoning in, in physics. And let's see, how does this go down? Um, yeah, so in a way I thought this actually picks up a number of themes that came up in, in previous talks today. So one thing was, uh, one to agree with Elliot Sober said that causal markup condition and common cause reasoning is a powerful tool, and it's a powerful tool in physics as well. Um, somehow in the background is lurking some kind of view on um, the perspectival character scientific representation, where I think I disagree with Margie, but hopefully that doesn't affect the core of the argument so much, at least this quick sketch that I've given here. Um, so obviously I'm interested in the use of causal concepts in scientific um, inference um, as uh, that Richard Boyd discussed, um, even though in the end I want to say um, it cuts much less metaphysical ice than one might um, initially uh, presuppose. And I want to um, tell uh, John Worrell that you can be a, a, a structural realist and yet be a friend of causal relations. Um, he's shaking his head in sounds. Okay. So there's obviously, there's many pe uh, people today in philosophy of science, philosophy of physics, um, who subscribe to this neo Russellian view that Jonathan, sorry, I, I should have put you on, on this slide in your fear. It's only people who aren't here. And, uh, <laughs> um, or in one form or other, uh, deny that there's a place for causal relations in physics. And among them, obviously, are also um, friends of causation, like Jim Wood Woodward. Um, and they all think that causal motions play a legitimate role, or many of them are willing to concede, play a legitimate role in the special sciences and in common sense reasoning, but not in physics. And often the argument is because causal motions have a um, human face. Um, so there's a putative contrast that's drawn in various ways, for example, by Barry Lower, but also by Hartree Field, or by um, Jim Woodward, that representations in physics are constructed with the help of global time symmetric laws, which take values of variables defined on each space-time point on entire initial value surfaces input. So that's representations in physics. 
Uh, by contrast, representations of the special sciences, which often are causal representations, are constructed with the help of local force grain and time asymmetric laws or relationships that only hold relative to specific background um, conditions. So I think um, a lot is wrong with, the, with uh, drawing this contrast in this way. Um, so this is a general kind of skeptical argument that uh, one can try to um, extract from, uh, from uh, this contrast. Namely, that there's a certain feature X that is characteristic of causal models, and this feature is often, uh, this feature is often pragmatic, user-dependent, perspectival um, features. Um, but representations in fundamental physics don't or even could not have such a feature. Therefore, causal notions play no role in fundamental physics. Um, so in this very brief remarks here, I want to um, briefly look at two versions of this argument, one appealing to the uh, essential role of background conditions and the second to the um, asymmetry of causation. Um, okay, here is a version of the argument um, uh, 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 now, so concerning background conditions. So causal models permit or even require a distinction between causes and background conditions against which we select causes. You know, this condition like this is the motivated, it's the hard to feel, for example, does this by appealing to um, the common sense causal claims like the striking of the match causes the flame rather than the presence of oxygen or the absence of a bomb in the room next door. Models in physics do not permit such a distinction. Again, we represent phenomena through complete models com uh, constructed on complete initial value surfaces as input. Therefore, there's no place for causal representations in physics. In fact, both of the um, premises of this argument are wrong. I just briefly want to look at the second premise here. Um, so, how is this representation of physics supposed to work? Well, we want to represent the goings on in some space time region, and we do this by, um, so we have our dynamical laws which determine initial value problems, so we need to specify the state of the world at some earlier time or at some later time, um, and so plug that in to determine what happens at this. Uh, space-time point. So if we have a non-relativistic theory, um, this is in fact a quite a difficult task because arguably we have to um, plug in the state of the entire universe at this earlier time and might even, that not, might not be enough. Um, so we're somewhat better off in a relativistic theory. All we need is the complete cross-section of a backward light cone. Um, but, but that too is somewhat of a tall order because if we choose an initial value surface just one second before the time of interest, obviously we need complete data in a spatial region with 300,000 kilometer radius as input. And such data are rarely available in this strike. Um, now, but this raises a puzzle because clearly the point is right that the, um, the dynamical re equations require full initial data as input. So um, briefly, how is the, might this puzzle be solved? Well, I just want to point at two possible ways in which it's solved. One is um, our theories don't just uh, let us formulate complete initial um, value problems, but also um, more general boundary value problems. So for example, we can specify what's going on in the space-time region here by, by having a mixed um, initial and um, boundary conditions problem where we specify <coughs> the state of the world on an initial value surface plus on some spatial boundaries. So that can significantly cut down the size of the region we need. And then you might say, well, these spatial boundary conditions, maybe they function, play an analogous role to the background conditions in the construction of causal models. There's another consideration, which is at least as important, if not more important. We make decisions on what to include on an initial value surface. So even if we represent it as a pure initial value surface, the physicist has to decide what kind of um, uh, variables to put onto this surface. Um, so for example, if we're project having a particle theory, we can decide to put just the state of, let's say, five billiard balls on there and leave the rest of the uh, universe empty in our model. Or if we have a field theory, we could decide to just um, uniformly take large regions um, of um, space um, to have zero value, um, zero fields on them. So we have to put um, the value for each variable at each point, but we can decide that they're, um, that they're all identically zero in large region. So I think what we need to distinguish is mathematical from physical completeness. We need to specify the model mathematically completely, otherwise we just can't solve the equation. Um, but what that doesn't entail is that we have to stick in um, the precise physical or the complete physical state. Rather, we idealize and abstract. And that seems to be exactly similar to what's going on in causal uh, modeling. We decide to include certain variables as causes and leave other um, relations um, unspecified. 
outside of things and outside of the model. Outside of this line, I mean, if any, take any example from physics, you find exactly this going on. So let's go to um, very fundamental physics. So how is the um, how is the, how are events um, modeled and and CERN at, in the at the LHC? So the Large Hadron Collider. Well, the proton beams are modeled classically in an extremely coarse-grained way. External influences are modeled in an extremely coarse-grained way, and the large. Um, so you basically, instead of putting in the physical, complete physical details, you are heavily idealizing you know, the properties in more detail. Um, so this very quickly, so, this did, so to the extent that, that some people believe that um, this distinction between background conditions and causes, causes is crucial, the same kind of distinction is drawn, obviously, in modeling and physics. Um, okay, next. Next um, argument, and this is, I think, maybe the main argument that a lot of people um, rely on who think that causal reasoning plays no role in physics, is that because the laws of physics are, are taken to, assumed to be well, time, the time symmetric, time reversal invariant, of course, then it's always a question, are uh, really the, all the most fundamental laws. But I think that's the going assumption. So the fundamental laws are time reversal invariant, um, and that is supposed to create a problem for including causal relations um, because, and this is a quote from a paper by Hugh Price and Brad Restlake, time asymmetric causation would have to be something over and above physics. It would amount to a hyper-realism about causation, which threatens to make causation that is both, both epistemologically inaccessible and practically irrelevant. So the idea is once you um, stick in um, you know, your you, and initial values into your time reversal invariant laws, you can calculate both forwards and backwards, and um, you know, the, any kind of asymmetric causal relations just do no work. But what this assumes, there was one implicit assumption here, and this ties us in with the previous considerations that I mentioned, is that all inferences or explanations in physics or in fundamental physics can, in fact, be exhausted, be characterized in terms of this um, dynamical laws plus particular initial and boundary conditions model. Um, but, and here's the second quick sketch of an argument, limits on the available evidence result in an underdetermination problem that can be solved with the help of causal assumptions, in fact, as I can try to argue, with the help of standard common cause reasoning. Causal assumption representations allow us to draw inferences from very incomplete information where the dynamical laws simply can't get a purchase, they can't um, um, get going. And here is a particular stark example of this. Imagine you're looking up at the sky at night. Um, you see all these points of light, which we all take to be, of course, the light to be emitted from stars. What underwrites this inference that we think these points of light is the light em em uh, emitted by um, stars? Well, you can't get it through a purely dynamical inference because what you need, would need to do in this case is specify the, the fields on the complete final value surface in this case, um, and the complete state of the world, the final value surface, which now just isn't 300,000 kilometers across, but we several, several light years across, and then calculate backwards, plugging this in, say, in classical electrodynamics onto the state of the source vector. Obviously, this is absurd. You can't do this. What we do instead, I think, is we observe very strong correlations between the mo momentary observations at, well, at different times, or you know, if you're standing there with a friend and you're both looking at the same light point, um, uh, observe between different observations at the same time. And what we infer is that from these very strong correlations between these um, different light, these light points, momentary li flashes of light we see, that there is a common cause of them, namely they were emitted by a star. So, um, yeah, so we're, there's correlations between our, between our observ observations here. Um, so so it's, it seems to be an instant of standard kind of common cause reasoning. What this, of course, assumes implicitly is that there can't be any highly correlated source-free incoming fields from distant regions. So what we need to assume, in, in essence, is that the incoming fields are somehow uh, uh, are uncorrelated, or to put this into a language that's more familiar from the causal modeling literature, that the exogenous variables are independent. In fact, what we can do here is we can, oops, we can, uh, if we so want to, bring the entire formal apparatus of causal structural models as developed, for example, by Perl and others um, to bear. And you know, I can't go into more detail, but one way in which I think this works. So we have our structural models, which can be represented through a directed acyclic graph, for example. So our light points 
the, as it, um, have the light points we observe have a common cause of the past, meaning the, the star. And um, what we need also is the structural equations linking the source to our observations. And what we use there is something that's in fact given to us by the dynamical equations, namely the so-called causal means functions, which specify how a point-like disturbance um, propagates. Um, and now, of course, once you have this formal apparatus, you can prove that a common cost principle holds for deterministic systems with probabilistic independent exogenous variables. So you need to have this, add this assumption, this initial randomness assumption under, um, to underwrite your um, causal. Um, okay, so basically that's the end of the quick argument. So now uh, a very brief objection. You might say, well, um, I always talked about fundamental physics. Well, when people speak about fundamental physics in this context, they don't mean um, our ultimate theory of quantum gravity. They mean any kind of suitable fundamental theory that's on the books in physics. So classical electrodynamics in this context, for example, or classical mechanics is a fundamental theory. So Jim Woodward, for example, speaks of fundamental physics and then uses classical electrodynamics as an example. Um, so, but still, um, isn't the kind of reasoning I went through kind of very much on the uh, applied side? So truly fundamental physics, so does, uh, can't we then ultimately get rid of these causal notions? At the very least, you might want, uh, might object, the Laplacian demon would have no need for causal notions. So quick response to this. Um, well, I guess as, as at least the, the, the younger ones among us that I learned a long time ago from Nancy Cartwright, um, there's at least two types of models, um, models that are, are possible worlds allowed by a theory. So model theoretic models of a theory's laws that she calls theoretical models. And then the models we use to actually represent the phenomena, uh, the world of phenomena, so-called representational models. So it seems to me that we use these theories to represent the world, and what a theory tells us about the world is given by the structures we actually can and do use to represent the phenomena. And what is empirically confirmed in the first instance is these representational models. So if you look at our case got screwed up, I have moved from a Mac to a PC. So I think that the confirmational situation is, in, is something like this. So we have our dynamical equations. They have these theoretical models, which are these uh, complete specified on the uh, entire time slices world. But these models are in a way we can't confirm them because we just don't have access to the right kind of data. Then there's also these representational models um, we use actually to confirm our theories. But, and this was supposed to be the very quick argument sketch I gave a minute ago, those often need to uh, make use of causal assumptions in order to, because we don't have the kind of data to plug, in, plug into these kind of models. Um, so what we actually confirm is something that, of course, uses resources from the dynamical equations, such as the, the Green's functions, but also causal structures. Um, now, what I think the causal skeptic, the neo Russellian, has to claim is that when we confirm such a model by comparing to our data, then from this model, and these <coughs> dynamical models, confirmation only flows upwards to the right to the dynamical equations and not to the left to the um, causal structures we employ. And that I don't see why this should be so. I mean, if we confirm these guys in the middle, why doesn't confirmation flow up equally in both um, directions? Um, okay, but still, couldn't the Laplacian demon do without causal notions? Because the Laplacian demon, after all, has access to the entire state on the initial value surface. Well, here I want to add, um, question what really the significance uh, of the Laplacian demon is. I want to actually contrast two perspectives. So one, the perspective of us humans who are stuck with very incomplete knowledge of initial conditions, and um, we can't do without causal um, relations. On the other hand, let's kind of think of a demon like that, you know, if you know the, the, these discussions by Barry Lower and David Albert, the demon who has access to the entire human mosaic. Um, okay, so we need laws and we need, um, initial, uh, we need causal relations. The human demon, the human god, needs neither. He just knows the entire mosaic, so he can do without causal laws, uh, out causal relations, and without laws. Somewhere in the middle is this Laplacian demon, and I'm just wondering, I'm not sure what the, um, uh, what the philosophical significance of this middle position is um, supposed to be. Um, okay, so in the end, I don't think, though, however, so I made this case now very quickly that we need causal notions, even in physics, but in the end, I'm not sure this cuts much metaphysical ice. Um, because there's two perspectives you could have. One is you could um, 
believe in kind of thick causal um, production or so. And then what you would want to say is that the, ca uh, the causal asymmetry in the end is going to explain to us why initial conditions are uncorrelated. Namely, because these initial states didn't have common causes in their past that can explain the correlations. And um, on the other hand, though, you might adopt a more Humean perspective. And then you're going to say, well, um, since the Humean mosaic has this asymmetry, that initial conditions are somehow distributed more randomly, that's what underwrites causal reason. That makes causal reasoning possible. Um, and yeah, since you can have these perspectives in both of those, I think in the end, um, there's not much metaphysical to remove from the, use, the importance of causal reasoning in physics. Um, OK, very quickly, so um, if, ca if causation has a human face, as some of these uh, the neuroscientists claim, then it's the face of scientific representation more generally. All scientific representations, well, this is actually taken from a much longer talk. We're also talking about partiality and coarse grain. Um, they involve a distinction between salient factors and background conditions and often appeal to time asymmetric constraints. Um, the partiality of our axis is it makes, even in physics, causal representations especially um, useful. Oh, I wanted to add, right, and so once you adopt this kind of pearl um, um, approach, you can be a structuralist about causal relations. You don't have to buy into, like I said, you don't have to buy into the heavy metaphysics. You're structuralist about causation, um, nevertheless, um, yeah, so causal structures and yet represents things just as objectively real or unreal as other aspects of models and physics, be a structuralist, be a structural realist, be an empiricist, but causal relations are pretty. Okay, thank you. Time for one, maybe two questions. Okay, just quickly, in fairness to Hugh, I think his primary target is against, it's not a claim, it's a strong claim that um, causal reasoning has no place in physics. So he's kind of against the person who wants to reapply causes in the fundamental fabric. So I think you would be happy with almost everything that you said. But I want to ask another very quick way of putting this to see if you would agree with right. Once you have the back, so agree that you can't get the causal even in those sort of thin permeates from law, but as a background um, randomness uh, assumption, then it does look like, or, or would you agree with this, that you have, given the background randomness plus the laws, these kind of emergent relations among certain variables that are captured in the act when you make the right assumption. So then, then you have you know, all of the, the kind of in how the difference remain available by yeah. that. Yeah, no, but this one I think was supposed to be the point at the end, but this is really at least where my metaphysical intuitions give out. I mean I have no idea how to how to um, uh, uh, adjudicate between that picture that you just sketched and the view somebody who like like Tim Maudlin who comes with more um, notion of you know, production or so or so that, that it's um, what really explains um, the, the, this asymmetry that on one hand we have the randomness, the other hand we don't, is is some kind of causal laws that drive the whole thing. So, yeah, yeah I no, I'm with you on that. I think you're yeah, and, and that just, I don't, I mean, so I want to stay out of this and then say, look, you, you fight this out, I have no intuition. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I have a question about First of these, and the second of them also, uh, had to do with physical plausibility. Um, uh, I like the Fresnel example. Um, Fresnel was also famous for many other reasons, and one of them was the derivation of the dragging coefficient expression. Um, when stellar aberration was discovered, it did occur to people that if you filled the teleco telescope tube with water, um, that would slow the light down and the angle of aberration should change. And in this way, you might, at least in principle, be able to determine the absolute velocity of Earth. Um, for now, by uh, a sort of seat of the pants argument, um, deduced that inferred that the dragging coefficient was of the value 1 minus 1 over n squared, where n is the refractive index. And the model that he used for this was a standard ether model. Um, 
Now the formula was, was brilliant. And it was rapidly confirmed that when you put the water in the telescope tube, the angle of aberration doesn't change. I mean, it was a stunning empirical success. But the ether model on which he allegedly derived this result by some sort of inspirational magic um, didn't make any sense at all because it depended on the refractive index. And so the angle would have, sorry, the degree to which the ether was entrained in the, uh, in the moving water um, would have to vary with each of the frequencies of light involved. So if you're dealing with white light, there have to be gazillion numbers of different kinds of ether each being selectively dragged at a different rate corresponding to their respective refractive agency. Um, to cut a long story very short, the uh, Fresnel dragging coefficient was brilliantly reinterpreted by Einstein. And uh, as he, most of you are familiar with this, uh, he saw it as a direct instance of the relativistic velocity addition formula with no underlying physical model necessary at all. Um, that seems to me as an interesting case because there were good reasons for being extremely skeptical, doubtful about the underlying physical and ontological model, while at the same time having excellent reasons for wanting to preserve that structural law in later physics, as indeed it was preserved. Um, the other example that was fresh to my mind because I, I made a mistake in my class that I was teaching just before I came here and had to do with a very complicated argument that Galileo gives on the third day of the dialogue on the two chief world systems. This is the argument from sunspots. Um, everybody had been persuaded by the observations first made by Galileo and by others the movement of the spots on the sun clearly indicated that the sun itself was rotating and the spots were more or less fixed to the surface of the rotating sun. The period of this rotation is about once in every 28 days. And the axis of rotation is almost vertical to the plane of the ecliptic. It's about seven degrees up, but that's immaterial to this argument. What Galileo pointed out was that in the Copernican system, we have a very neat explanation of the variation <laughs> in the trajectories traced by the sunspots at various times during the year. Uh, at three monthly intervals, the paths traced out over a succeeding period of days and weeks, uh, straight lines moving left to right or right to left at the two equinoxes. And we see concave and convex trajectories in the summer or in the winter three-monthly period. Um, it's very easy on the Copernican system to see why this has to be that way. Uh, it's simply a reflection of the fact that we're viewing the motion of sunspots on the sun from the vantage point of an Earth that's inclined at 20, 23 and a half degrees um, to the orbital plane of the Earth around the sun. And so we're seeing the spots sort of directly at the equinoxes, and we're seeing the spots moving either you know, above us, as it were, as seen from below, or below us, as seen from above, when we look at them at the summer solstice or the winter solstice. So we have a very, very elegant, powerful uh, illustration of the empirical uh, adequacy of the Copernican system. Now, the argument on the third day uh, says that both the Ptolemaic and indeed the Taconic system in which the Earth is completely stationary cannot give a physically plausible account of the same phenomena. And the reason is very briefly this. If the Earth is stationary, then the Sun is moving around us, obviously. It moves along the ecliptic plane, as defined by the, uh, the Earth-bound astronomer, uh, about one day um, sorry, about one degree every day, because the Earth appears to move us around us once a year. But also during the day, at an angle of 23 and a half degrees to that plane, the Earth is performing a diurnal motion, or apparent diurnal motion. We see the spots relatively unchanged during any day. And so the Earth must, in fact, always be seeing the same face of the sun as it's presented to the Earth as the sun moves around us. And this was 
pretty normal um, an assumption for Ptolemaic people because they assume that just like the Earth's moon, any object that moves around the Earth always presents the same face. In other words, it actually rotates as it goes around, so that we always see the same face. Unfortunately, on the very same Ptolemaic or the Tychonic account, you also have to reconstruct the fixed relationship between the axis of the sun's rotation and the axis of the Earth. And of course, in Ptolemaic account, the axis of the Earth is vertical. The axis of the sun is a 23 and a half. If you, if, you, uh, if you assume that with regard to the sun's annual motion around the Earth, that it presents the same face, then you get the wrong result. So what you have to attribute to the sun, conclusion, is a conical processional motion in the other direction about another inclined axis, the axis about which the sun is undergoing its monthly motion. Right? Now, so you have four motions. And it's not just that there is less parsimony here, that there are four motions as opposed to the three that Galileo and Copernicus had to posit. But it seems so physically implausible, as Galileo points out, that a physical body should be rotating in two contrary directions at such a large rate of knots about these uh, two inclined axes. So if I had written a paper, this is what I would have talked about. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's about the, the gist of it. I, I think that most people who are realists, certainly um, in the history of science, have taken this kind of physical plausibility considerations uh, to be absolutely of the heart the reason why they thought that some theories were close to the truth and other theories probably not. That's all I have to say. I knew there would be no questions. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Uh, I of you. Uh, I think Robert is with us. A counterexample to your last remark was the fact that in the history of debates on Copernicanism, there was a kind of uh, instrumentalist side that said there is no truth of the matter. For example, Leibniz, there's no truth of the matter, but there are, all these, there are considerations of physical plausibility that will mean something to the astronomer, provided that the astronomer isn't a realist about the true mm -hmm. status of the system. Yeah, I, I was impressed by a phrase that uh, Peter Barker and Xavier um, and, uh, Gary uh, used. And they described most people in the tradition that um, you know, Pierre Duhem and others have written about as frustrated realists. It, it wasn't that they were instrumentalists in our sense. They wanted to be realists, but because they were also Aristotelians, uh, they couldn't you know, match the Aristotelian physics with the kind of technical complexity that was required by the Ptolemaic theory. Um, I mean, there are all sorts of reasons for being skeptical about the, um, the specific uh, equivalence that the light explained uh, in that essay. Um, but I think the vast majority of, of people, as I say, were not instrumentalists. <coughs> They wanted to be realists, but just found themselves incapable. So, you know, they divorced physics from astronomy. Newton that? is a, an example of a stronger argument from physical possibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You really couldn't have uh, a tectonic system unless you introduced really strange hypotheses about yeah. how it might be at work. Yeah, how on earth could the universe as a whole, outside of the Earth, be rotating about a, you know, an unoccupied axis that runs vertically through the Earth's north south axis? Yeah. Yeah. And it always struck me as odd, incidentally, since we're being historical, um, uh, how Aristotelians could so readily accept the diurnal rotation of the heavens, since again, it's, it's not about strictly about a center with spherical symmetry, it's about a north south axis. Uh, that has cylindrical symmetry. And it, it's just an odd fit for our team. I'm sorry, it's. You're done? Um. Oh, let's thank all of our panelists.